Uh, hello everyone, my name is Natalia and this is my YouTube channel Seagull the Explorer. Today I will make a reaction video on Geography Now about Belarus. Uh, recently I did another reaction video uh, on the history of Belarus. I did that in Russian. Today I will do my reaction in English because the original uh, video is in English, but I will try to provide the Russian subtitles. All right, so let's dive in. All right, so um, honestly, no offense, but I I had to write to read the subtitles to understand what was the point of this. It's no offense, but sorry. It's time to learn geography now. Ah, Belarus, the land where people will tell you, "Don't call me Russian." As they say that to you in Russian. Okay, this is strange because there are numerous countries like this. For example, in Austria, they do speak German uh, and they will say to you, don't call us Germans. And they will do that in German or, okay, in, in the USA, um, they, well, nobody would call them English, but still they do use English language. So... Yeah. Okay. But first, you know the drill. Let's dissect the flag. The flag has two bands, one red taking up two thirds of the height of the flag, and a green one in the lower third, and a white rushnik pattern on the left hoist side. According to Alexander Lukashenko, president since 1994, around the time that the flag was created, the red represents freedom and sacrifice of the nation's forefathers, the green represents life, and the rushnik pattern has more of a cultural connotation rather than a symbolized one. Rushnik patterns are used consistently in Belarusian cloths and woven material. All right, just just to be clear here we do not use it constantly i mean the pattern here the our national um pattern uh we use this pattern only for traditional clothes some rushniks have hidden meanings but the one on the flag doesn't really have one but you know what is official the borders of belarus and transition <laughs> Now this is where things get fun, because in order to understand Belarus's boundaries, you kind of have to look close and find the few oddities that stick out. First of all, Belarus is located in Eastern Europe, landlocked between five other countries, Russia, Ukraine, and Poland, and Lithuania, and Latvia. The country is divided up into six regions. This one is called Brest. <laughs> Brest. One special administrative district, Minsk, the capital city. And getting into Belarus is going to be relatively easy for all the neighbor nations. There are various roads and trains that travel to Belarus from places like Poland, Russia, and Lithuania. However, Border guards have the jurisdiction to pretty much deny entry to anyone they deem as not worthy and have no problem sending them back. Typically, if your nationality is not from the Eastern European region, you may find it a little bit more difficult to enter. And this is one of the reasons why Belarus is one of the least visited countries in all of Europe. Okay, uh, I know that this video was made six or seven years ago. Uh, this situation has changed now. So now it's not that. Um, difficult to come to Belarus. So since I think 2000, 2018, uh, there was a law introduced uh, allowing everyone, I think, I, I don't think there are exceptions, everyone to come to Belarus uh, for 30 days without any visa. But uh, the only thing that you have to come by uh, air and you need to arrive in uh, Minsk International Airport. Minsk is the capital of Belarus. So now this information is outdated. Um, it's relatively easy now to go to, to, to go and enter the country. Long story short, if you aren't A, Eastern European, or B, you don't speak any Russian or Belarusian, or C, if you don't have a Russian or Belarusian friend to vouch for you, then getting in might have a little bit more of a complication, and it might cost you a lot in visa fees. However, Belarus loves visitors, you know, they're just suspicious of all you guys. That's so, no, this is not true now. Uh, a lot of people can come to Belarus right now. Uh, just one small note, he pronounces... Uh, the adjective for Belarus, Belarusian, as Belarusian, which is, I think, not correct. Not I think, it's not correct. We we like to call them the, um, ourselves Belarusians. Mm -hmm. 
That's all. The borders are strange because even though there are lots of rivers and lakes, not many of them define the borders of Belarus. I mean, sure, you have the short river borders like the Katra River in Lithuania and the Dnipro River in the south of Ukraine, but most of the borders are just arbitrarily drawn lines situated over land in which the trees and bushes are hacked to show the territory marks. Some of these borders get weird, like in the north you have the Adutishkis railway station split between Lithuania and Belarus, in which for about a mile, heading east you'll be in Belarus, and heading west you'll be in Lithuania. Also you have an island split between Belarus and Lithuania in Lake Richu, and two islands and two peninsulas in Lake Drukšie or Drisvati. Look, I'm trying my best to pronounce these Slavic and Baltic words, just bear with me. And let's not even get started on how Lithuania was like, eh, I'm just gonna take this Dievenishku Isturinis <laughs> National <laughs> Park from you guys, even if it does give me like a one mile wide corridor to reach it. The weirdest part though would have to be the small Russian Sankovo Medvieshe enclave in the south near the border by Ukraine. This place used to, and technically kind of still does, belong to Russia, and under it is an old Russian military base. However, the entire place, including the base and two small towns near it, are virtually abandoned and empty. Why do you ask? Because of Chernobyl! Back in 1986, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster actually affected mm -hmm. Belarus more than it did Ukraine, and to this day, a huge portion of the south that border by Ukraine is left completely abandoned due to the radioactive fallout that still lingers to this day. Due to the fact that there are no more operating checkpoints, this spot is notoriously known as the prominent place in all of Belarus where the few desperate and incredibly stupid people go to smuggle things in across the border. You know, at the risk of radiation poisoning. I got that thing you wanted. <laughs> It's actually kind of sad because on a vantage point, the area is really beautiful with lush forests and green pastures used for farm- Oh wait, before I talk about that, uh, we have to show the transition. <laughs> There we go, perfect. Like I was saying, Belarus's Southland is actually very green and lush. A huge portion of this land prior to Chernobyl was used for farming and agriculture. However, today it's sadly kind of neglected by force. Thanks a lot, Ukraine! We could have used that land for like food and stuff. About 70% of the radiation from Chernobyl went to Belarus, and a fifth of Belarus's land was affected by the fallout. This is partially the reason why Belarus is a lot more urbanized today than it was prior to the 80s, since- By the way, just a small note. Uh, so here on the big, in the picture, we see Minsk, so the capital of Belarus, and uh, these buildings, well, they are not very famous, but they do have their own name. So in Russian, they are called kukuruzniki. Uh, kukuruza in Russian is corn, and they do like, they do look like corn. So yeah. Many people were displaced and evacuated from the region to avoid the danger. Today, however, with the help of the UN and other agencies, they are trying to combat the fallout problem by using cesium binders and rapeseed. I feel really uncomfortable saying that, but rapeseed cultivation as the plant is known for absorbing the cesium-137 isotope. This is one of the few Western world backed up projects in Belarus as they typically shy away from anything past Poland. Otherwise, the land of Belarus is generally flat. As a landlocked nation, they have no access to the sea. However, they do have more than enough water internally with an abundance of rivers and lakes. About 40% of the land is forested. Some of them are captivatingly beautiful, like the Belavezhskaya Forest in the west by Poland, one of the few places where you can find the rare European mm -hmm. bison, Belarus's favorite animal, which is even featured on the emblem. And by the way, the, uh, the name for this in Belarusian is Zubr, so this European bison a mascot for various hockey teams. The most common resource in Belarus is peat, which I just learned is some kind of decayed vegetation slab thing that can be used for both fertilizer and fuel. I don't know, I'm not a pediatrician. Belarus is also located in the transitional zone between the continental climates and the maritime climates, so the weather is sometimes a little bit erratic. Summers typically range lower than room temperature around 18 degrees Celsius or 65 degrees Fahrenheit, so you probably won't see any bikinis or speedos, but you Well, um... He, he doesn't mention that, but uh, yeah, usually summers are not very hot in uh, Belarus, but we do have, we can have maybe three, two, three weeks of heat. So last time, well, last summer, for example, um, I think it was 37 even in Minsk um, for, for some, for several days. So you can't say that uh, it's very you know, cold there. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's quite the opposite. Yeah, it's very hot. You know who you will see? This is probably going to be the most interesting part of the video. The Belarusian people are what really make this enigmatic country stick out. First of all, Belarus has about 9.5 million people, about 84% of... I need to make a stop here. There is a mistake there. Belarusian is spelled with one S. One. Sorry.
Some identify as ethnically Belarusian. The weird thing though is that even though over 80% of the people identify as ethnically Belarusian, only a fraction of these people actually speak the Belarusian language. That's right, Belarus has its own language. In fact, the Belarusian language is kind of like a mixture between Polish and Russian and is about half derived from the Russian language. So if a Belarusian speaks Belarusian to a Russian, right. the Russian will be able to understand basically the overall gist of what the Belarusian is trying to say, but will still have some problems with the particularities. Even more confusing, many Belarusians actually speak in a transient. Okay, so here is another mistake. It's not Transyanka, it's Trasyanka without N there. The first one, uh, yeah. And it's a mixture of Russian and Belarusian language. A dialect, which, which is, is like, like a mixture of Belarusian and mm -hmm. Russian. The president, Alexander Lukashenko, even speaks in a Transyanka accent sometimes. Speak! All right, so before we go there, because we go further, so I'm a language nerd, so I will need to stop here uh, when um, the languages were discussed. So it was true that uh, we have two state languages, two national languages. One is Belarusian, another is Russian. The majority of people, that's true, speak Russian in their everyday life, but um, I think the majority as well would understand. Belarusian, maybe Belarusian, so maybe they do not speak it in everyday life, but okay, I wouldn't say all of people um, know, uh, can speak Belarusian or understand, but the majority will, I think. So, according to Ethnologue, uh, this is like a Wikipedia for languages. 11% uh, of people in Belarus speak Belarusian um, as their everyday um, language, so as a means of communication. Another 26% um, will speak it as a second language. Um, so this, these are the data according, uh, this is the data from the latest census, which was held in 2020. Um, Another, in, uh, so uh, Russian and Belarusian are not the only uh, languages that can be used in Belarus. Uh, so interesting fact, uh, around a million people in Belarus uh, can speak English, of course, not as their first language, but as their second language. And um, uh, around 300,000 people can speak German, again, as, a, as their second language. Uh, there are some more languages that are spoken in Belarus, but not so many people speak them. For example, uh, Tatar uh, can be, can uh, is you, is uh, spoken in Belarus, but only by twelve thousand people. Uh, Russian Sign Language is also uh, used by um, twenty eight thousand people. Uh, even Korean is spoken in Belarus, but only by a thousand people. There are some more, like Ukrainian and Polish languages, uh, but again, they are spoken by not so many people, so... Um, yeah. Anyway, Speaking of Lukashenko, yeah, since independence on. from the former Soviet Union in the 90s, Belarus has only had one president since 1994, Alexander Lukashenko. And to understand Belarus, you kind of have to know who this guy is. By the way, uh, so... The video was made maybe six or seven years ago, and this information is still true. So since 1994, Belarus has had only one president, and today is uh, 2022, uh, and Lukashenko is still the president. Many people in Europe will tell you that Lukashenko is Europe's last real dictator. And I mean, when you have a guy who wins an election and makes laws that extend his terms and then the number of terms that he can serve, yeah, the term dictator doesn't really seem too far-fetched of a title. Lukashenko is a strange but kind of funny leader in that, yes, he's kind of been accused of human rights violations, and yes, he's been accused of being slightly racist and slightly anti-Western, and he's always speaking in a brash, slightly aggressive tone that kind of makes him look angry. However, you can't deny the fact that he did kind of build up Belarus with a slightly better infrastructure than it was during the Soviet rule, and to this day, unemployment has dropped to nearly 1%, and they actually prosecute citizens who don't have jobs. And the cities are always clean, and the crime rate is incredibly low, making Belarus one of the safest places in Europe. Okay, so he mentioned something about he prosecutes people who does not work. Actually, that's true. We have a tax, an unemployment tax, according to which people who do not work, so who are not officially working, uh, have to pay a tax. 
Technically, because punishments for crimes are incredibly severe. Granted, the currency exchange rate and GDP is always low too, and jobs pay very that is minimal. True. Uh, so we had like a severe. picture of Granted, the, the of the uh, currency there. Uh, this is not the the currency that we use. I mean, we do use Belarusian rubles. Yes, that's true. But uh, this is not the one that we use. This is, I think, the uh, this kind of money was used. Oh, uh, you can see there, 1992. So. These um, banknotes uh, used uh, were used in the 90s. Now we're using something else. Currency exchange rate and GDP is always low too, and jobs pay very minimal. And with a state-owned structure, company privatization is almost completely non-existent. But hey, that just means souvenirs are dirt cheap, right? Lukashenko has his opponents, and trust me, there have been a lot of anti-Lukashenko protests. But a lot of the people. Yes, that is true. Um, especially it is true about the latest ones after the uh, last presidential elections in 2020. Uh, the protests were massive. Well, in Belarus can't deny on the surface at least that he's kind of a relatable person. I mean, as an athlete, he absolutely loves hockey and constantly plays it himself, even at exhibition games, sometimes with his own sons, which is why in 2014 he was delighted when Minsk hosted the Ice Hockey World Championships. Plus, I mean, look at that mustache. Just look at it! Nonetheless, Lukashenko has successfully gotten Belarus in a bit of heat with the rest of the EU and the Western world due to the way how he runs the country, and to this day, relations are kind of non-existent or strained with them. Well, good luck, Belarus! You're off to a great diplomatic start. All right, so before we go into the friend zone, so I guess he will be talking about um, the relations of Belarus with other countries. Um, yeah, so when talking, when speaking about people, for some reason, the authors decided to focus only on the president yeah i understand that he he has been the president since um, yeah since 1994 yeah but devoting the whole i don't know three or four minutes um speaking about people of belarus and speaking only about the president it, i don't know it's not I feel sad uh, being a Belarusian that uh, when describing people from Belarus, people for some reason think only of the president. So, uh, and there is more to Belarus than just the president, you know, who have been sitting uh, there um, for many years. There are so many writers, sportsmen, artists. Um, did you know, by the way, that Mark Chagall is actually of Belarusian descent? He was born in Vitebsk, so one of the <clears throat> one of the cities in Belarus. Uh, speaking of writers, uh, we have and we have and we had a lot of them. Um, I don't know. The first that comes to my mind is Vladimir Karatkevich. Um, not, yeah, well. From his works, only one was translated into English. Uh, it's called uh, "The Wild Hunt of the St of uh, the King of Stachs King." Uh, so in Russia, in Belarusian, is "Tikaya Polevanya Karala Stacha." It's a it's a very uh, it's an incredibly uh, good story to read. I would recommend it to everyone to read anyway. Uh, um, so, of course, uh, Karatkevich has more, but yeah, they are not translated into English, so it's hard uh, to to explore uh, his works. So, another writer that I would like to mention is Vasil Buiko. So, he devoted uh, his works to World War II, uh, which is quite a... Th th this is a very important... Um, period for a uh, period of history for Belarus um, so yeah his works um, he, he wrote a lot of works and I think that they uh, at least some of them are translated into English so I would advise uh, to check them out as well so these are more classic ones this, these are uh, writers from the middle of uh, the 20th century uh, if we're talking about modern Belarusian literature, well, at least one name comes to mind, that's Svetlana Alexievich. So she's from Belarus. She's a Nobel laureate in uh, literature. So I think at least some people should have heard about her. Also, um, 
she describes she describes a lot of uh important topics in her uh works so i would definitely recommend her as well uh just just to you know familiarize with um belarusian literature because it feels like everyone knows about russian a lot of people know about ukrainian but uh, i'm talking i'm just talking about eastern slavs um and for some reason, Belarusian literature and Belarusian culture just like non it feels like non-existent. So yeah, I would I would really recommend um, checking checking the works from Belarusian authors as well. All right, so let's move on. You can probably guess Belarus is a little eh when it comes to friends. I mean, yes, they have their affiliates, but it's a little complicated. First of all, Belarus's relationships are strange because they get along best with all five of their border neighbors. However, due to sanctions imposed upon them after allegations on Lukashenko, they are essentially closed off to the EU, which is weird because Poland and Lithuania and Latvia are in the EU. This makes things interesting because Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia are kind of seen as like conduit countries that act as a bridge between the EU and Belarus. Every so often the EU will do experiments in which they will lift some of the sanctions to see if Belarus will engage. Typically Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia get involved. Poland and Lithuania have been close friends since day one anyway, as Belarus has been part of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth for over 500 years. There's always been in a sense, a Polish and Lithuanian influence in Belarus for the longest time. Afterwards, things switched up and Russia kind of took over in the 18th century, and that's when things really started to get Russia-fied. Even the name Belarus means white Russia, and that's where- All right, so uh, I get why they, why people do that, but Rus is not Russia. You know, Russia is the country that we have now, the, the biggest country in the world and everything. Rus is not Russia. So, okay, I just had to mention that. Where the three sisters come in, Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. Common. All right, three sisters, uh, I guess. Uh, yeah, well, I understand this video again. Uh, I mentioned this several times already that it's an old video. So a lot has changed um, since the video was made. Yeah, uh, this is not true now. This is uh, not how it works right now. The Slavic sisters. These three countries understand each other better than anyone else in the world. When it comes to Ukraine, Belarus actually, at some points, got along with them much better relationally than they did with Russia, and the Ukrainian language is actually closer to the Belarusian language than Russian. By the way, that's true. Um, so Ukrainian and Belarusian share about 85 or 84 percent of words. So it's um, it's easy to for us uh, to communicate with Ukrainians when they when they speak Ukrainian. I mean, um, to Russian, um, well, at least U Ukrainian uh, only has sixty two or sixty four percent of common uh, words with Russian. So Bel Belarusian is. Um, similar to that and belarusian by the way is uh closer to polish than to russian making exchanges much more easier for them where things got sour though was crimea back in 2014. russia invaded the ukrainian held region of crimea and amidst all the circumstances belarus actually kind of sided more with russia than ukraine which made ukraine kind of like <gasps> belarus how could you so you think russia is best okay so I'm not an expert there, but I think, I still think that in uh, 2014 crisis there, uh, Belarus um, was neutral, then sided more with Russia or Ukraine. Uh, yeah, you cannot say that about, uh, about current situation, so it's pretty clear with whom Belarus is um, siding, but it's it's also a very hard topic so it's even for me um it's difficult to say that belarus is siding with russia it's not belarus it's not the people you know all the people who is siding with russia but uh that's the government who does that anyway 
as friends with Belarus, and they kind of are. I mean, on all levels of diplomacy and treaties, yes, it's kind of true. However, it's more like a love-hate relationship. For the longest time, Belarus was kind of seen as like Russia's little puppy. Everything started out great, and in the mid-90s, they signed treaties and friendship agreements and cooperation deals. They did huge business, and Lukashenko and Putin would ski together in the mountains. But then over time, Russia got a little, what Belarusians would describe as, pushy. They accused Russia of trying to bribe them numerous times to assuage their national advocacies, like in the 2000s, they tried to get Belarus to recognize the South Ossetia and Abkhazia regions, and after the refusal, Russia banned all dairy products from Belarus, commonly referred to as the Milk War. And then there were the Gas Wars and the Custom Control Threats, and to this day, Lukashenko and his legislators have even instituted a complete restructuring of the entire country's operations to become de-Russified. Textbooks, educational material, broadcasting, TV, even street signs are now being switched over to become exclusively published in Belarusian and not Russian. Children are being taught Belarusian first and Russian second now, and this was done as A, a response to the tiring relations with Russia, and B, as an attempt to resurge the sense of nationalism in the population. Uh, I just have to make stop here. I just wanted to make a comment on the picture there. So this is the uh, national state national library of uh, Belarus. So it's located in Minsk. And uh, yeah, I even heard uh, someone said that um, this is someone from this is something from Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. Belarus. In conclusion, after years of crazy messed up drama, Belarus is really starting to learn how to become Belarus again. One small diplomatically strange step at a time. Stay tuned! Alright, so that's it. And well, apparently Belgium is coming next. So, um, in conclusion, what I need to say now... Um, so, by the way, First of all, thank you, the authors, for this video. Uh, thank you for everything they do, because um, they expand the knowledge about the countries that uh, people don't know about or people don't uh, know not so much about. Belarus is one of those countries, I think. I, I met a lot. Well, a lot of people, um, when I introduced myself and said that I'm from Belarus, they were like, what? So... Uh, thank you, the authors. Um, it, it was a great, it was a great video, especially in the um, in the time of making the, the, uh, this video. Um, most of the information was true, uh, and uh, yeah, we need to give them a lot of credit for doing so much research uh, into the countries. I. Um, yeah, I, really, I appreciate, as a Belarusian, I appreciate how much research they did and uh, uh, for creating a video about Belarus. Uh, yeah, uh, because I think that there is not so much information about Belarus, especially in English. Mm, just one thing that I need to comment. I already commented on, on uh, some things, so about the language, about the people. Uh, I really was not frustrated, but sad that they decided to describe the people from the point of view of the president. Honestly, I would add some more people or more description of people than uh, than description of who the pre who our current president is. Um, anyway, but one more thing. I watched some more video of um, Geography Now, some uh, recent ones, and they uh, add some more information in their video, one of them being uh, the cuisine. Uh, here, they didn't um, do, they didn't say anything about cuisine, so I will do that. Uh, so, in Belarus, we love potatoes. Uh, and we make a lot of dishes from potato, and one of our national dishes, yeah, one of our national dishes is uh, draniki, so it's in Russian or Belarusian language, uh, and uh, they are basically the potato pancakes, but they are very delicious, and I would recommend everyone um, uh, taste them. Um, all in all, uh, that was a good video, but uh, a lot of information is now outdated, so um, whenever they have time, 
yeah, I think they they would need to remake the video at least about Belarus. I don't know about other countries, but Belarus that's one of those is one of those. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for this video and thank you for, thank you all for watching and um, uh, hope to see you soon. Yeah, bye.